So hi everyone, John LaRue here again at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. As you can see, the gallery here behind me, uh, unfortunately, is closed, uh, as you well may know, and so I'm honoring that as well, doing it from outside the gallery walls. But I'm here to talk to you about a very special exhibition, which, unfortunately, most of you only got about two weeks to see, but we're, we're hoping we can still have some of it here to show when all of this is all over. And it's Emily Carr, Fresh Seeing. Oh, <laughs> from my Australian friends. There it is. Emily Carr, Fresh Seeing. And it's a fantastic exhibition that was loaned to us by the Audain Art Museum in Whistler, British Columbia. It's one of the best new art galleries in the country. Fantastic architectural building, won all kinds of awards. And so, obviously, with, with Fresh Seeing, it's a way to see Emily Carr in a fresh new way. And it also talks about her way of seeing the world in a different way. And it deals with her, her trips to, to Paris, to France, and how that changed her way of looking and also her way of seeing Canada and the Northwest Coast and the Indigenous world and the world that surrounded her in a fresh new way. And so uh, let me take you through it. I'm going to take it um, uh, digitally as well because again we can't see the exhibition inside but I'm going to take you through a lot of the individual pieces and it's a fascinating story. Emily Carr, as many of you know, is one of the most revered artists in Canadian history. She's pretty much the most famous British Columbia artist. And she was working at a time in the early 20th century when it was not easy for certainly single women to be uh, considered at the highest echelons of professional art in Canada. But Emily was, and she was championed by members of the Group of Seven and the Canadian Art Establishment. And at the time, you forget, being in BC was a tremendous uh, distance from Central Canada and the annals of the Canadian Art Establishment like the National Gallery and so on. But Emily did very well and she's certainly most known for her large portraits of the bold enormous heroic trees uh, of the BC rainforest um, and also for her indigenous villages of the west coast. And the latter ones are a little bit more problematic uh, but we'll talk about that in just a bit. So again with the exhibition Fresh Seeing it talks about and deals with the really important but often overlooked aspect of Emily Carr's career. She was trained in the States and in Canada as a younger woman, but in 1910 she wanted to go basically where the action was. And if you're an artist, the action then was in France. The center of the art world without question was Paris. Uh, Impressionists, the post-impressionists were working there. Picasso was there. He and Georges Braque had just invented Cubism a few years before in uh, the mid-1900s. So when Emily Carr left the very conservative British Columbia in 1910 to go to France, it was with the goal of, of absorbing and training under the most modern art which she could find at the time, which uh, in her mind was post-impressionism and the fauvism, and expressed by artists like Paul Cézanne or Van Gogh. Their work was a reaction against the, the need to be naturalistic in their view. You could abstract the view, simplify it, uh, have color, uh, be much more emotive in dealing with feeling rather than trying to replicate a view. Uh, unfortunately, Emily didn't know French at all when she was there, so she was able to seek out some British uh, artists and instructors like J.D. Ferguson, the famous uh, Scottish colorist who was teaching there at the time. And what she was able to get was a new, a new vision, a new language, a new form of expression, which was essentially post-impressionist. And she painted a lot of uh, scenes very similar to the Camus kind of Cezanne, like of the landscapes and French countrysides. And then when she got back to British Columbia, she was able to bring that, that, uh, that mode of expression with her. You can see these effects when you compare some of her works from before she went to France to those that she did immediately after she came back. A great example is a pair of paintings done in 1908, 1912 of the exact same subject, some war canoes, big dugout war canoes in Alert Bay, British Columbia from an indigenous village. And the 1908 version is, uh, is a very capable watercolor, but it's pretty restrained in its color palette and it's really about capturing detail. The 1912 version, where you can see the post-impressionist voice, is much more alive, it's more energetic, it's got vibrant color that just uh, pulsates, uh, you know, greens next to reds, so you're getting some real contrasting colors. It gives us almost sort of floating effect, so it's not about copying naturalism, but a feel for the excitement and passion uh, of that vision and subject. So in 1912, she spent six weeks visiting communities all along the northwest coast. Indigenous communities of the First Nations, such as the Wet'suwet'en, the Haida, the Kwakwakwaku, and Gitsan. 
and she did some of her more famous uh, paintings where people really associate uh, this period of Emily Carr with the, the totem poles, the longhouses, the communities, and they're, they're wonderful works. Uh, but this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated, looking at them from a 21st century lens. There's no question that the totem poles and longhouses gave Carr tremendous artistic material and a, and a sense of purpose. But we also know now in revisiting this time that she was recording them because she thought that they were fragile and disappearing. And so much of white society at the time considered Indigenous culture as literally being on its last legs, that it was, it was in a sense going to be gone within a generation. And so you get this sense of salvage anthropology where, where white society would go in, they would take the totem poles, put them in museums, often without asking. Uh, an artist would go in and depict them without taking that deeper step towards understanding the culture or understanding that these totem poles were, were clan heraldry. In fact, they were uh, symptomatic of, of the families that lived in these longhouses rather than just decorative objects. It becomes sticky. It may be hard to imagine today, but at the time, a lot of Carr's works were met with ridicule and disdain. She actually tried to sell a series of them to the BC government, and they said, no, go back and try to make them more realistic, and we might consider it. So, so she had her own fair share of difficult times with this material at the time uh, with, with her own society. Um, one of the things to consider is that a lot of contemporary Indigenous artists today do recognize the, the tremendous value in Carr's work as historical depictions of, uh, of their ancestral villages. But uh, even at the time, she was highly regarded by the Indigenous communities. They gave her uh, the, the nickname of Klee Wick, which means the laughing one. And that actually became the title of her autobiography, which was the winner in the early 1940s of a Governor General's Award. In so to show you a lot of the works from the West Coast in the Fresh Seeing exhibition, I thought it'd be appropriate to have a music of a traditional Haida song playing, which was recorded by the Smithsonian many decades ago. So here are a number of the works from the show. <laughs> Car works are beautiful, they're fascinating, they're inspiring, but they're also culturally complex as we've spoken. But they still have a riveting effect to people today and even artists today. An indigenous artist named Sunny Asu took a Beaverbrook's painting called Cape Mudge, an Indian family with totem pole, and he turned it into this uh, work which in his mind takes this sort of Star Trek inspired ship to come down and save the indigenous communities to a brighter future. So there's a pretty abridged version of the Emily Carr Fresh Seeing exhibition, but when we do open again, hopefully we can accommodate it and we'd love to welcome you back to see it at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery.